Welcome to this week's episode of the Prep Athletics Podcast. I'm proud to have Hotchkiss School's head coach, Joe Busaka, join us today. And Joe uh, had a really good college career. He was Conference Player of the Year. He was an All-American. And he became one of the youngest NCAA head coaches at Curry College at the age of 24. He went from there to Amherst College, one of the top academic D3 schools in the country. And now he's in his second year at Hotchkiss. And we talk about Hotchkiss as a school what his pitch is. We talk about the 10 and about these 10 high academic prep schools and and kind of what they are and what they do. We talk about what makes a good application, what makes a good interview to get in, not to just Hotchkiss, but any prep school. And then we talk about everything else to include getting his players placed, the benefits of having one team, the benefits of coaching a program uh, that he took over at Curry College that was very unsuccessful, and, and much, much more. So great conversation with Joe today. Thanks so much for tuning in. Enjoy the podcast. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe, maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh, yes, yeah, somebody wants me. Joe, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Looking forward to this. You are the current head coach at the Hotchkiss School. It's uh, part of the 10. It's part of NEPSAC. It's got a long history. Tell me what makes Hotchkiss so special. You know, I think you, you hit the nail on it, being a 10 school in itself. But I think the, the location piece of it uh, matched with the, with the boarding rate. Um, you know, a lot of our peers have boarding rates that are similar to ours. So we're 95% boarding. Um, kids don't go home on the weekends. Um, we're fortunate enough to have a really, really cool residential program where the kids really enjoy themselves while they're up on campus. Um, their location is, is incredible. We sit on over 800 acres. Uh, we have a nine hole private golf course. Uh, we have a 212,000 square foot athletic facility across campus. We have our own private section of the lake. Um, it's in a beautiful spot of Connecticut. Um, the spring um, and the fall are really fun times for our kids on campus there where it's just like kind of littered with being outside and the energy is really high, but you know, being a really high, like a, like a true boarding school with a lot of faculty being on campus as well. And you develop these, these, these unique relationships, um, makes, makes our spot pretty unique in that spot where you're going to have a bunch of different connections with adults, students. Um, so I I would say that that's probably the biggest thing, um, in terms of like what makes us unique from, from a school, from overall school standpoint. And you mentioned the 10, can you explain to the people out there that don't know what the 10 is, what that is? Yeah. Yeah, so the 10 schools is an admission organization that um, we travel together from an, from an admission standpoint, and we go to different spots around the country, um, and, and we pretty much share cost, and uh, we go and try to find uh, students in different spots of the country, and, and the world as well, um, and um, it's, it's us, Hill, Exeter, Andover, St. Paul's, Loomis, um, we travel together as a cohort, and um, you know, a lot of our schools are, are aligned academically more than anything else. Um, and we, we try to move the needle that way and try to share costs and, and, and go from it and from that standpoint. Perfect. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, so you mentioned what makes Hotchkiss special. When you talk to families, what is your pitch? Like, what do you say to them when you're recruiting them to come play basketball for you? Yeah, I, I think, I think for me, my pitch is, um, <clears throat> I care deeply about the connection I make with my guys. Um, so I want to get to know you at, at, a, at a really personal level and get to know what you want to do from a dream standpoint and, and, and how I could kind of just be a part of that dream for you. Um, and I don't promise them anything from a playing time standpoint. I don't promise anything from what's going to happen on the court in games. What I promise them is I'm, you're going to get better when you're here. Um, whether you're a post-grad, an upper mid, lower mid, or a prep, you will get better while you're at Hotchkiss with me. I, I live in the gym. Um, I care deeply about the skill development piece. Um, you know, I, I, I played in college and, and I still love being on the court and just seeing guys get better and seeing stuff that we do translate to the games makes me really happy. Like wins and losses are great and I want to win as much as possible while I'm here, but I want to get these kids to matriculate to schools where me, the school and the family that I'm recruiting are all happy with. Um, and that's for our place. That's usually Ivy leagues, Patriot leagues, Nescags, the high academics of the world where, um, they're going to go on, get a four year degree and be set the rest of their life with a Hodgkiss alumni base and, and possibly like a Columbia heart and alumni base. And, um, that's what I want. Right. And that's what I pitch the families. Um, and, uh, I just try to, you know, I try to show them who I am and try to be as genuine as possible. Um, but that's really it. That's really it. The skill development piece and, and just telling them when to be there for them every step of the way. And, 
Um, I try to let my actions um, show way more than anything else. And I put them onto my players. Like as soon as you get on campus with me on a visit, the day is set up where I'm going to give you a tour for 45 minutes to an hour. And then I'm going to put them onto my players and, and let my players, because they're the best ambassadors of my program, right? Um, mm -hmm. Those are kids that we're excited to have in our program. They're the best recruiters. Um, and they're going to be really honest with the kid as well. And I tell my players at all the time, don't lie, right? Like I'm intense. I'm passionate. I, I'm emotional. I understand all that. I'd rather the kid know that so when he gets here, he's not shocked. He's not shocked that I'm going to be um, asking a lot from the kid from a conditioning, a lifting, and a playing standpoint. Um, so that's what I do. And then I sit with the parents and we talk about um, who I am, how I do the college process, how involved I am, who I'm connected to, um, and who I will be. Like if, if I'm not connected to somebody, how I go about trying to find that connection and, and getting them to our campus. Um, so it's it's like a, usually a two hour visit, um, and then once you get on this campus, it just blows you away as it is. So it kind of this, the campus itself is a lot of the talking, which is great. Yeah, let's get into that real quick about college placement. So this is your second year there, right? Yep, second year. Okay, second year, and you know you went through it last year, and now you're going through it this year. Obviously, we got the transfer portal going on. Obviously, you're a former college coach, which we'll get into. But talk to me about the conversations you're having with families before they come to school and with current kids about placement level, right fit, all of that. Yeah. So like before, before I, I recruit you, right? I, like, obviously I'm going to get the transcript and I'm going to look at it. I, and I, I, my biggest thing is like, where, where do, what do you want? I ask that question right away. What do you want? Right. And I'm cool with kids wanting to go to like mid majors. I'm cool with kids wanting to go to low majors. I'm cool with kids wanting to go to specific spots, but that's probably not the spot for, for us at Hotchkiss. Like we fit into the realm of Ivy Patriot high academic world. And, um, NESCAC, uh, UAA, all that stuff is, is kind of our niche. So I want to make sure that that kid wants that more than anything else, right? Like you come here, you don't get Columbia, you don't get Bucknell, you don't get BU. Are you okay with going to Bowdoin? Are you okay with going to Bates? Um, and that's kind of our niche. So I want to make sure that's the first thing that we talk about from a conversation standpoint. Um, and then like the, the best part about what we do is like, we have an incredible social media page and you could just scroll through and see who comes to our gym in the fall open gyms, right? That's a huge time now. Like I don't, when I was a player, I don't remember fall open gym being that important and being that big. But as I got into college coaching, I remember being like out of nowhere, it was like, I got to go to these fall open gyms and kind of see these players play and um, get around some of these new England prep schools. And, and now being here, I, from, from August, beginning of August, I'm, I'm developing our open gym schedule around our class schedule and making sure that we could get every Ivy, Patriot, NESCAC, UAA possible through our doors to see our players. Um, and that's what I tell the parents. Um, when you have guys um, who have that recruitment already, it makes it easier. Um, but when I talk about college placement as well, we play in six or seven showcase games a year, right? So when you're an underclassman, we're going to put you in front of college coaches right at the start. Um, and when you're a post-grad, um, I tell them sometimes too, it's like we could play the waiting game and we could kind of wait and see because we're going to play in zero gravity. We're going to play in basketball tournament. We're going to play in New York City, um, the Rise of Star Show. We're going to play in these big showcases where there's going to be 15 to 20 college coaches there. And you know what? Like, I'm cool with putting our eggs in that basket. And if you perform at a high level, you're going to get what you want. Um, and I'm cool with that. So it's a conversation between parents and stuff. Last year, I had a postgrad that went to Columbia. He was done in September. A rope rope was done. He didn't care about where um, the where, where the showcase games were. He just was like, I want to go to Columbia. This is what I want to do. And, and that was it. So um, this year I have a postgrad who's still waiting and, and trying to wait and see what's going to happen with him. So it all depends, but I'm cool with it either way, as long as we're on the same page. Um, and as long as we get applications into certain spots, just to make sure that we have a landing spot at the end of it. Um, and, 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 and we're happy about what's going to happen if, if you don't get your dream of division one, possibly. So, um, but I'm really involved in the college process. I want to, um, I'm on the phone all the time. I'm sending videos. I'm sure college coaches can't stand my name sometimes when I'm like constantly sending the videos and, and updated highlights. And, um, you know, so I work really hard for my kids. And if, if you want something that, that I don't really know about, I, I will make sure that there's the basketball world is six degree separation. So we're going to find somebody that, um, that knows somebody and we'll try to get, it, we'll try to get to work. Yeah. And you have one team, right? One team. Eight guys, so, eight, eight to nine recruited guys. Yeah. So how many guys are you placing this year? So this year we're placed um, one, two, three kids. So we have three seniors um, that are recruited basketball athletes. One of them is going to Haverford. Uh, this, my starting point guard is going to Navy. 
And then we have the post grad who's trying to figure out right now with a couple of IDs and uh, has homes at Nescax. Um, so just trying to wait and see what he wants and, and where he wants to go. All right. So I'm friends with everybody in the prep school world. And there's a lot of my buddies that have second teams out there, but there's something to be said about you only having to place three players. So you have a lot of bandwidth to spend on just three players versus potentially 25. And of course you're helping your younger guys too, just getting their name out, but you're not working as hard for them. But that's something that families need to know is, Hey, I'm placing three guys this year, maybe four next year, max, maybe six. And yeah. that just leaves so much more time for development, for getting more phone calls for each kid. And I think that's something that really needs to be explained to folks that are looking at schools with one team versus schools with multiple teams. And look, every kid needs to make their own decision. Sometimes a two team option makes sense for certain families, but that's just something I want to make everyone aware of. Like, that's the benefit of going to a school with one team, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And like, I always say that all the time. Like, and you're gonna play, right? Like, we yeah. don't, we never gonna have more than nine guys on our team. I don't want that. Like, we play a 32 minute high school basketball game. It is impossible to play 10 guys in 32 minutes. Like, I don't care what anybody says. Um, so having a smaller roster is something I like. Um, and we're gonna, you're gonna get to your point that development on an individual basis and having to only worry about eight guys from, from that standpoint as well is way easier than having a huge group work out of 25 to 30 kids. Um, and some people do it at a high level, like John Carroll at NMH was a pro at it. I used to go to his workouts and be amazed at what they were doing. Um, but I just, I don't have the bandwidth to do that. So that's why I sure. love it. Like Oscar just fits me and my identity way more. And I like to have the individual attention to each guy and it's just easier for me in my day to, to go about it. All right. You mentioned something else I want to educate people on. You mentioned you play 32 minute games. And I know NEPSEC AAA plays 40 minute games. Yeah. What are the pros and cons of 32 minutes at your level? Yeah, I, I hope that that changes. Like, I think last year we put in a, a, a vote to get to 36, which I thought would be awesome. Um, and it got bumped to next year. Um, that might change. But the pros to a 32 minute game, I'm going to be honest with you, I don't see there's any pros. Like, you're going to go and play in college, you're going to play 40 minutes. I, right. I wish there was more, more um, parallels to the high school game than a college game. Um, so I don't think there's many pros, honestly. I'm I'm gonna I'm like I'm probably hurting myself from a recruiting standpoint with that. But there's a bunch of incredible class A schools. I think would agree with me that we should we should have more minutes, right? The game is high level. Um, I think there should be at least 36. But um, you know, in a 32 minute game, the pros of it, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna lost. There's there's probably there probably okay. isn't many, to be honest with you. I I really don't think there is. I, that's why. Uh, I think a lot of us in the, in the in the prep school world are, especially in Class A, are pushing so hard to get the extra two minutes a half, which which makes a huge difference. Honestly, how does it make a huge difference? It's a little. It's for the thirty six minutes for me. It would be a small step than the than than the than the right now the sixty minute halves. Um, I, how it makes a difference? You, you could play a little bit. You could play guys a little bit more minutes, right? You have yeah. two minutes and a half to kind of work with. So you're able to kind of extend the rotation a little bit more. And maybe that freshman that that would only play in a perfect world three minutes, like three minutes a half can now do that. But when you're playing a 32 minute game, guys, you don't need like you have six timeouts as well. So, so you could really, really save guys legs and, and, and play them longer periods of times because and you have a 10 minute halftime. So um, I, I think the way the way the basketball is going, it, it should be 18 minute halves. But again, um, having the ability to play guys a little bit more and placing the young guys, those extra minutes would be so helpful to, to places yeah. like us, in my opinion. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. That's that's, that's a good way of thinking about it. Um, your job there at Hotchkiss is, aside from just playing basketball, or I'm sorry, being the head coach of the basketball team, is your assistant director of admissions. Yeah. So what tips can you give kids that are applying to Hotchkiss and other prep schools when filling out their application? Yeah. Um, you know, be unique, right? Be whatever, like we read everything, right? The entire application we are sniffing through. We are trying to find, you know, like students that have the capacity to be leaders in our community, the capacity to do more when they arrive on campus, maturity. Um, so like I always say like the essay portion is your time to really sell yourself. Um, and there's times where we read some really basic essays that it doesn't feel like there's a lot that went into it. But if you if you sit down for an hour and a half, two hours, and, and you hammer home the three essays on the portion of most applications, that shows you that one, like you care and you and you want and you want this. And and we get to find some really, really cool stories about about what makes you you and what you've been through. And a lot of the time, like we have some young kids, obviously a 13, 14-year-old uh, freshman that 
you know, they don't have a lot of lived experiences, but some of them do. And some of them are some incredible stories that make them really unique and makes like we're, we're a 10 to 15 percent acceptance rate. So for, with that being said, like we're trying to find unique kids that are going to are going to push this school forward. And um, I would say the essay piece is, is, is huge. And, and, and obviously making sure you stay off, you stay full academically, especially at these 10 schools and making sure your grades are A's, mostly A's with some B's like um, all that stuff is great. But like be like make sure to showcase who you are from an individual standpoint and what makes you really unique and stand out because those are the kids we remember in, in the process. Can an interview make a, can an interview help or hinder? Oh, well, it can hinder. Really? Give me an example. Hinder, yeah. yeah, it can hinder. I think there's times where um like the, the biggest thing for the interview, we want we want to see how the kid would be almost in a dorm, right? Like it's more of a conversation. I don't even call them interviews when I interview kids. I'm like, let's just have a conversation and let's talk about what your interests are, your passions are. Are you able to connect with an adult? Are you able to have the back and forth rapport for, for 25 minutes? That makes it really fun. Um, it could help you as well. Like there's times where we, we love to get an interview, but you got to make sure the file matches up. But I think more times than not, you leave the interview being like, I don't know if this kid could, could, could like, could cut it here. Like um, quiet, shy, reserved sometimes, but and then you see the application sometimes on the flip side of it. It's like, oh, wow, this kid's really impressive. Like, you know, let's maybe give him a chance. So it, it, it goes both ways than anything else. But the interview is a, is a unique part of the application in, in the prep school world where um, you could really showcase who you are as a person. And, and we could be really excited from you about your energy and, and how infectious you are and, and how you sell yourself. But um, it depends. It depends. Yeah, and I've heard of schools that offer merit. I know your school is all need based, but a kid has gained money, earned money towards merit package based on having a killer interview. That's crazy. Yeah, just because they just lit up the lit up the screen or the room, and the person's like, "We need them there. What do we got to do to get that person here?" That's and impressive. So it can mean a lot. And here's the, on the flip side: confirm this for me. If I get a C my first semester, uh, a freshman year, that will affect me at one of the ten schools trying to get in, most likely. It depends. It depends. Like if you're a post-grad and you have a C your freshman and sophomore year um, and you have all A's your junior senior year, right? Like for college placement, you have an upward trajectory, right? You, okay. you struggle maybe your freshman and sophomore year. As a, as, a, as a freshman coming in, you have a C on your eighth grade transcript. It might be tougher, right? The conversation, like what's that class in? Is he taking an AP level class as a freshman? Is he in algebra two pre-calc as a freshman? Like is he pushing himself? Is he in, is he in pre-algebra and getting a C? Like it depends. It, it, it's, it varies, right? If you're a junior and you have C's your freshman, uh, one or two C's your freshman year, all A's your sophomore year, we get your junior transcript and it's all A's again. Like that's a conversation like, oh, it's an upward trend. Like he needs this. He needs this. Here. Let's, let's repeat 11 him. Let's get him two more years of Hotchkiss grades. And now that C is so distant, it's not even there anymore. Um, so I think, I, I think it depends. I, I think there's, um, um, it's not, it's not, Hey, you got to see we're we're not, we're moving off of you. It's, um, is, is there a narrative behind it? And, and, um, is what's the rest of the file look like? Gotcha. Okay. I've, I've heard too, like the, you know, I guess the upward projection is a good thing, but I've heard that yeah. freshman year, like some kids slack off until they figure out what high school is like. Yep. And sometimes those mistakes are, are, can be fatal for certain schools. Right. Yep. But that's good to say what you're mentioning about the post-grad and the upward trajectory. So, uh, Joe, does working in admissions help you, uh, get players and know what to look for? Let me get players. It's, it's hard no matter what. I think it makes me know what I'm looking for, right? I think coming into this role, I didn't know anything about admissions, I thought. And then my director, my dean of admission, Irby Mitchell, was like, no, you do. You, you did it at Amherst, right? Like you vetted kids, you put them into the pre-read process. You understand what, what bands are, right? At the, at, the, at the collegiate level, you understand what academic index is. Um, so you've done it before. You just, Now you're just doing it at a broader sense of the, uh, and, 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 and from a student standpoint. But I don't, I don't think that... Um, it just it just helps me understand that what I'm looking for from a kid and what working here as well makes me understand what a Hotchkiss student looks like as well to our point before right where I talk to some kids I fall in love with a kid I talk with them I meet with their family I'm like I don't think you're gonna fit here and I and I have the conversation I'm like hey like I just don't think you would fit this spot and I actually think you would be miserable here let me be honest with you like it'd be really really tough for you so and those are real conversations as well I want to make sure that as much as I like a kid from a basketball standpoint, if they don't fit culturally here, I'm hurting the kid. So I don't want to, I don't want that to happen either. I want the kid to come here, absolutely fall in love with his experience. And um, 
So I make sure of that as well. I try to vet that as much as possible. All right, we're going to go to your playing career now. So we're going to go in a time machine. And when oh, you were man. in college, you were conference player of the year and you were an yeah. All-American. So uh, kudos to you for that. But tell me this, Joe, what was your process? Like, what did you do to get that good? It's funny. Um, I think my college coach, who's the head coach at Bucknell, will tell you that um, I don't – like, I, I went into college being – like a 19% three-point shooter my first two years. Um, and my college coach came to me and he was like, listen, like you're going to be an average player the rest of your career pretty much if you don't know how to, if you don't figure out how to shoot the ball. So I went back and I changed my jump shot. I was like obsessed to a point with, with getting better. Like I think people say that a lot of the time, but like I, I woke up every day at 5 a.m., uh, went to the gym, uh, put up a thousand shots, lifted at 12. So I, I, I went to college being 150. My junior senior year, I played at 175. Um, changed my body, um, changed what I ate, um, dedicated myself. I wanted to be a pro. I, I really wanted to be a pro. I wanted to, I, I felt like I was under recruited. I always played with a chip on my shoulder. Um, and that's how I coach as well. Um, but I really wanted to become a professional basketball player overseas. And, um, you know, I was able to talk to some good people in New York city. I had a, my brother-in-law, TJ Tibbs was a huge part of my life. And, um, he really ch helped shape who I was as a player and, and helped me understand what it means to work hard. Um, not just kind of go to a gym and just mess around for three hours, but go there and actually get work done. And, um, you know, that was it. And I, I think I became a leader, um, a little bit more my junior and senior year. And, um, that also changed, right. Having people rely on you on a day-to-day -day basis made me real, like, I think made me a better player. Um, and then being around a coach that believed in you at the end of the day, right? Like he put the ball in my hands. It was like, Joe, this is, this is all you like, you're going to, we're going to be as good as you. And hearing that was like, a coach can give you any more comments than that. Like, I don't need him to tell me you're doing great. You're doing this. He put the ball in my hands. It was like, I don't need to tell you this ever again. Like, this is all you. And just having that back and that confidence was, was incredible for me. And um, so I was fortunate to be around some good players, some good teams and some good coaching that, um, you know, kind of elevated me a little bit, but. You said you fixed your shot though. Like, how did you do that? Did, did someone teach you on it? Did you go to YouTube? Did you just shoot more shots the way you've been shooting it? So I'm a lefty. Um, so there was this dude, Novak at Michigan, um, yeah. back in like, back in like the early, like 2011, 2012. And he was my favorite player. I couldn't shoot for nothing. And I was like, I want to shoot like Novak. Like, that's what I want to shoot. Like, so I literally would YouTube him and watch him day in and day out. And I used to shoot from like my chest. Um, almost looked like my coach would be like, you almost look like shoot like a lefty Sean Marion. Um, so I want to put it in like a shot pocket and a shot window, um, I stood in front of the basket. I didn't play pickup. I didn't shoot anything outside the paint. I stood in front of a basket for, for since from March until June and took a thousand form shots a day because my muscle memory would constantly put it almost in the middle of my face. I, I raised it, but it, it, so it took a long time. It, it, was, it was not fun because I missed a bunch of pickup days and, but I knew I had to change it somehow, but that it was just, Going to the gym, watching film, um, watch, not watching film, watching YouTube videos of Novak and being like, all right, pocket, pocket. And just filming, my, filming myself and making sure I was doing the right thing all the time. And um, so that was what it was. It was it was just me just being in the gym and just living in the paint, which was not fun. So You, you know what I love about that, that story too, Joe, is that you didn't have a trainer. You didn't hire a strength coach. You did it yourself through free methods like YouTube. Obviously, the gun costs money, but most programs have that nowadays. But yeah. You don't need a trainer. You don't need a shooting coach. You can do it on your own. Those things help. They're supplements. But for kids out there that don't have the money or the resources or even have a good trainer in your area, you can do it on your own. And that's what's so beautiful about the sport of basketball. Yes. You just need a ball and a hoop. Ball and a ball hoop. And a hoop. Yep. Uh, at 24, you became one of the youngest NCAA head coaches in history by taking over the head, head job at Curry College. Um, tell me how you got that job. Uh, it was crazy. So, um, I was, I'm at Hannibal college for two years and I coached this kid to me, Quinlan. Um, his dad had connections to Curry college. His son went there and, um, Curry went through a really rough three year stretch. They were like two and 73 and they were looking for a young coach. And, um, I was coaching his son, his son and I had a good relationship and he was like, would you be interested in being a head coach in college? And I was like, it's like asking me if I want, like, yeah, like this is my dream. Like, of course I want to do this. So I want an interview. Um, I didn't get asked. To, I didn't. I was the second option. I didn't get asked for the first time. They brought me back to camp the second time. Um, got asked for the job. Um, 
there's some people that told me not to take it, honestly, um, in, my, in my close circle, but I didn't listen. I was like, this is a no brainer. Like, are you serious? Like I, I could turn this around. Like I'm, I'm energetic. I'm 24. I could do this. And you quickly get to the campus and you quickly realize that there's stuff that <laughs> that's, that's out of your control a little bit. And, um, you talk about like a life changing experience and, and enduring some stuff from a hardship standpoint. I still talk to a lot of those players, which, which, which is the best thing about the situation. And a lot of those kids changed my life. Um, I was coaching, I was coaching junior college kids that were 24 years old that were my age. Wow. So trying to navigate the situation of, of being a leader, um, but also understanding like we're on the same level here, honestly. Um, and trying to do that. It was, it was a crash course and a lot of stuff and I'm happy I've had that experience for three years, but um, I'm also, it was, it was, it was a really, really, really um, interesting time. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, living in Rhode Island, um, going 45 minutes to work every day, um, recruiting more, the, the recruiting piece of it, trying to recruit to a school that um, historically doesn't have much success academically doesn't have much success. Um, campus was beautiful. The people there were awesome. The AD was incredibly supportive um, it was a fun place that, that allowed me to grow from, from a professional standpoint, which I needed in the, in the mo in like the worst way. So, um, it was, it was, and they're doing great. They made the playoffs this year. Um, I still follow them and, um, it's really cool to see what that, what that new coach has done and what, and what he's kind of like built, um, built there. So it's been it's pretty, pretty impressive to see. At 24, what was the best part of being a head coach at that level? What was the worst part? The best part was being, was being able to develop a culture, right? I got there. Um, and like the school has never seen a basketball program above a 3.0 GPA. My first year there, we got above a 3.0 GPA. So like developing the culture, getting the study hall down, um, getting guys to be excited about coming to practice every day. Um, it was, it was cool. Like doing community service. That was the best part, like seeing it kind of grow and then trying to get my first recruiting class there. That was awesome. The worst part was, which I would say the worst part was probably <clears throat> the, the losses accumulated, right? I think at the end of the day, you're in college coaching uh, as much as you want to change kids lives like you want to win and and that's how you you could kind of continue to climb the ladder and um you know that first year there I was one in 24 um and that was the hardest year of my life bar none and I got engaged that year to my wife not my wife but it was every single game trying to figure out like how to how can I close the gap and and not lose the culture that was hard that was really really hard um and, 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 you know, that at the end of the day, coaches are usually based, like, what's your win-loss record, right? Like, like, let's see what Curry College did. So I think that was hard for me and a tough pill to swallow, like, putting my ego aside and um, being like, all right, well, I'm doing the right things. Like, just trust it. And that, that was hard to do, um, honestly. So Interesting. And then what, what level was Curry College? Division three. Okay. What was your recruiting strategy? Were you doing JUCOs, which you mentioned? Were you doing prep schools, high schools, transfers? So I could never win a battle in New England, in my opinion. Like I was not going to win any kind of recruiting battle in New England. So my first year, we had kids from nine different states. So we brought in 10 players, nine different states. We had a Juco from Wisconsin. We have we had a Jersey kid. We had two Staten Island kids where I'm from. Um, we had a Georgia kid. We had two Florida kids. So I was just trying to be incredibly unique um, and utilize as many resources as possible um, to get on the road and go find kids. Um, I sent my assistant, there was times where I coached, where I had coached my first year by myself and would send my assistant on the road to go recruit because I thought the bigger picture for me was like, we need players. Um, and you need to go to this high school and show this kid love. Um, so, and a lot of these games were far away from us because I, in my mind, I was like, we're not going to win this battle and I'm not going to try to win this battle right now. Maybe down the line we can, when we change our program, but let's be unique somewhere else where these other places aren't recruiting. Yeah. Uh, what a grind, uh, which you learned a lot from, which is, which is great. So uh, you went from Curry College to Amherst, which is on the other end of the spectrum, um, <laughs> yeah. success-wise, academic-wise. What's the biggest difference between the two schools that you noticed right off the top? You can recruit anybody in the country that has grades, like anybody. I, I was talking to a kid who's now at University of Florida, um, and he would answer my phone calls. Like he was like engaged because it was Amherst College. So the brand of Amherst, who Coach Shears was, his Division One background, you could sell it to anybody, and people would be like, "Yeah, this 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 makes sense." Like, I, I I'm not gonna put, I'm not gonna hang up the phone here. Um, so being involved with kids like that, like we talked, like we got recruits that had Division One scholarships, like Charlie Randall, who was at Berkshire, 
um, was get had Albany had other offers and was like, no, nah, I want to go to Amherst because it's academic. I'm like, he's a seven footer with skill and he's he just had twenty something points in the in the first round of the NESCAC tournament against Con College and I'm like, like as a, it's it's just you could get involved with anybody with grades and that was the coolest part and it really opened my doors to being able to be connect with all these different kind of prep schools. And, um, and then in four months, I got a call from Hotchkiss, but it just was like, it opened up so many doors and, and opened my eyes to like who I could really recruit and division three, like that practice every day was so, so, so high level and being around some players that all had scholarships and stuff was just like, this is, this is basketball. This, this is, this is a lot of fun. <laughs> And just to give uh, listeners an insider, like a lot of my kids want to play obviously D1, but a lot want to play high academic D3 ball. What do they need to know about one, getting that level and what the playing's like at that level? Yeah. You know, I think, I think get it, like what they should know is there's a lot of kids in the country that want to play NESCAC and UAA basketball. That's one. Like there's, there's not a lot of spots to be had. And there's a lot, like you go to the Babson event um, for the high academic showcase and there's, 375 kids from the northeast corner like that one that want 75 spots so <laughs> there's not many spots to be had um and the level of basketball is insane like to think as a freshman you're going to probably play one of these spots right away is is almost non-existent like you don't see it too often where there's a freshman that goes in these kids are grown they're juniors and seniors they played usually prep school basketball in some capacity they're older, they're stronger, they're more mature. Um, it is it is very much a Division One basketball game, in my opinion. When you see Amherst with Williams play, and I would urge everybody to go watch that game this Saturday in the semifinal NESCAC game, where you watch Wash U versus Emory, like those are Division One basketball games um, with a bunch of high level basketball players in the court. Shot making is incredible. What they do offensively is amazing. The defensive assignments, what they do with ball, like it is insane. And the preparation that goes into it is unlike any other and you're playing back-to-back days so your body has to be able to take a friday saturday game um in the uaa i think it's friday sunday absolute grind uh, of, of a season as well and it's physical um so i i we i have a lot of the time when i'm in the locker room with the guys i'll put on a nescat game just because i want guys to understand that like we all want ivy league here at hodgkins and i get it but let, let's let's watch this game really quick because and, and guys are amazed. They're like, oh my God, like these kids are massive. I'm like, yes, this is what it is. This is this is high level division three basketball. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that and that's part of the transfer portal too. A lot of those guys might have played D one before COVID, and now it's kind of, you know, trickling down the D two, D three, and AI. So the game has gotten that much more talented at the college yes. level. So uh, last big question here. What do guards need to possess? to play at the D one level? It's a great question. So I tell, I tell my guards all the time, like, unfortunately, if you're going to be a point guard that plays for me, you're, I tell them all the time, you're going to hate me. Um, just because I, I, I coach that position so much differently than every other position. Um, you have to impact winning at the end of the day. Like if you're, if you're, if you're a point guard and I tell the kid, I tell my kid, I go to Navy this all the time. Like, it's great if you score 16 points, but if we lose by 15, we need to look at ourselves in the mirror and understand like, what did you do as the point guard to not impact winning? Like, um, that's my biggest thing. Like, are you defending at a high level? Are you communicating at an even higher level? Um, are we in sync all the time? What are you doing after timeouts? Are, we, are, we, are, are you and I talking? Um, do you, are you getting guys huddled every time? I think there's so many intangibles that coaches will look at, especially from a point guard standpoint that they want to see at the next level. Um, you know, the basketball piece is easy, right? Can a kid shoot it? Is he athletic? What's his body type look like? Is he 6'1", 6'2", 6'3"? That stuff is easy. But I think the intangible piece from being a leader and impacting winning with your energy and how you could get guys moving in the right direction is the biggest thing. Like we had a – there was a kid here two years ago, Kenny Nolan. Well, I didn't, get to, I didn't get to coach, but I watched him play a lot at Hotchkiss. He moved the needle so much, but just his energy – and when he had like that pop to his step that division one coaches absolutely love when the ball's in his hands, you know, good things are going to happen. And um, it's like almost a security blanket. Like Brandon McCreesh last year, when I coached him last year, like I would look at him down by 14 at times. And he's like, we don't need a timeout. I got you coach. Like that's an intangible, like you can't, coach, you cannot coach that. And four minutes later, it's a two point game. And it's like, all right. Yeah. He's, he's special. So I think that's, that's something that I constantly try to help. We have a sophomore point guard here now who that's all we watch film on. Like 
and, and talk about is your leadership impact and winning and trying to move that needle forward from a, from a point guard standpoint. And that's, I think that's the biggest thing. All right. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, we're going to do quick hitters right now. Okay. Who is the best player you've ever played against? Best player I ever played against. Um, I played against Trey Burke. Um, I just had this conversation the other day in the locker room with the guys. I would say him. Um, he was the first guy that like would come off a ball screen, hang dribble. He put me in a ton of hostage, hostage situations. And like, what is going? Like, he he was everything I did defensively. He had an answer for. Um, his pace was incredible. Um, so I would say Trey Burke. That was that was such a, a cool experience that I still remember when I was a junior in high school playing against All Ohio Red, um, and he was. Like it was incredible to play against him and just the pace and everything he did was was, was amazing. I would I would say him. All right, in the prep school world, who's the best player you've coached against? Or had the best performance uh, against you? Yeah. Um, this year, I'm gonna forget his name and I, and I apologize for this kid. But there's a point guard at Canterbury who's going to FDU next year. Um, he's like six three, physical. He gave us like 27 on like 16 shots. He he absolutely fried us. Um, and there was no answer for him. Like everything was like so – everything was tough. Pull-ups, get into the rim, finished everything over our guys. Um, that was like the one time I was like – I felt hopeless as a coach. And, and the guys – and like I said, my Division One point guard going to Navy is, is one of the best defenders I've ever seen. And he was like, this kid is so good. Like – he was hard to keep in front, and he was big and physical. Um, I would say that kid. That kid was – I cannot see what that kid does in college. That kid is – after you got a great one there. That kid is special. Special. Right, what's, your, what's your favorite movie of all time? Uh, Lord of the Rings. Okay. And lastly, Maybe. what are your hobbies when you're not coaching? Golf. Golf and, cool. and um, spending time with my wife. But um, I'm, I'm obsessed with golf. Um, I play pretty much every day in the spring and the summertime, um, just like kind of – my way to decompress and, and, and get out of the season um, and not think about basketball for a little bit, honestly. So, um, and it keeps me competitive. So I, I would say golf. All right. Is there anything you want to touch, touch on that we didn't mention in this podcast? No, I, I, you asked some really like, or, like some incredible questions that I think I was able to touch on things that I wanted to talk about. I would say like there, there's, there's a fit for everybody. And, and just to make sure that when, when schools are recruiting you, you recruit them as well. Like ask the hard hitting questions to coaches. Like, Yo, where do I fit next year? Right? Like, who do you bring back next year? Um, it's it's easy for us to sell stuff, right? Like, as that's our job as coaches to sell, but to kind of sniff through that stuff and and see and see genuinely where you kind of fit and 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 where you want to go and and how that's going to help you in the next step. So, um, what do what do you value and make sure that school values have the, have the same values that you want as well is my biggest thing all the time. I love it. Uh, Joe, thanks for coming on the podcast. It was great having you on. Great uh, sharing your story. Uh, where can people find you on social media? Joe Busaka too on Twitter and Instagram. Um, I'm pretty active on Twitter. Um, you also follow Hotchkiss Hoops on Twitter and Instagram. We we post a really a bunch of cool stuff. We have three different media managers. We put out videos all the time. So please follow us on Hotchkiss Hoops and and also on Joe Busaka too as well. Yeah, and Joe, thanks so much for coming on today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah, if you guys enjoyed this, make sure you subscribe to the Prep Athletics Podcast on all the major podcasting platforms. You can also subscribe on YouTube where we have uh, occasional bonus content. And then if you need to reach out to me with any prep school questions you may have, go to prepathletics.com. You can find all my contact information there. Love to help you out. So thanks so much for tuning in. We'll see you next time.